Access more. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dream Big Podcast. And uh, this is just so fun for me to have friends on that are doing great uh, things. If you ever like the Love Does book, uh, it's because of my friend, Michael Hyatt. Uh, he took a chance on this uh, guy that never written a book before. Uh, and uh, uh, Megan Hyatt Miller is with us as well uh, today for the Dream Big Podcast. You're going to hear about their new book, but more, most of all, I just want you to hear from voices that are really important and uh, trusted in my life. And I think as you follow them and learn from them, you'll find out why. So welcome, Michael, Megan. I'm so glad you're on the podcast. Thanks, Bob. Great yes, to thanks for having us. Oh my gosh, I get the benefit that only a few people have looking this on YouTube later. I get to see your smiling faces. And I uh, just want you to both to know like what an inspiration. I don't have blown sunshine at you. You just have been such an inspiration to me in the way that you're not just that you have a lot of wisdom, but the integrity that you're living in your life. Uh, oh, thank you. So I just want to thank you. Uh, what if uh, for the people that don't uh, know you, haven't run across you, which is very few, uh, tell us just a little bit about each of you. Well, I spent the bulk of my career in the book publishing industry where I met you, Bob, and I can remember exactly where I was reading your manuscript for Love Does. And I remember contacting uh, one of our publishers and I said, we must publish this book. And it was amazing. And so I was, um, at the time, the CEO and the chairman of Thomas Nelson Publishers. Then I launched this company. When we sold Thomas Nelson to HarperCollins, I launched this company, Full Focus. And my daughter, Megan, came alongside me a, a year or two later, and she's now the CEO of our company. And so now I work for Megan. And I'm- <laughs> I love and, that. And she's, she's a great boss. <laughs> And Megan, tell us about you. You, I can just yeah. tell you just are glowing right now. Oh, well, thank you, Bob. I actually remember, Dad, when you were reading the Love Does manuscript, because you as you sometimes did, not very often with authors, you would you would say to us as a family, guys, this is going to be a big deal, this book. And he was just so moved by that message and inspired. So I, I remember that too. Um, well, as my dad said, I am the CEO of our company, Full Focus. I'm also a mom of five kids, ages Holy 21 Lord. to three. And Bob, you have a part in our story because um, I'm sure you remember this, but our middle boys, Moses and Joan, are adopted from Uganda uh, wow. That happened in 2011, and you were a great encouragement and support when we were in country and trying to figure out how all the things worked. And you know, now they're they're all grown up. They're they're in middle school and almost high school, and uh, and then we adopted again domestically, and we have a little three year old. So we have all the all the ages and all the stages, and we're we're navigating um, balancing work and home life, and uh, it's pretty awesome. It's busy, but it's awesome. I think that's what makes uh, the two of you so relatable that there's some people that listen to this podcast that have a strong foot in the business world. And if mm -hmm. they do, these are voices you can trust. And then just trying to like parent and navigate or some of you are in the grant parent business as <laughs> I am now, but the ripples that go out, take of one act of kindness mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, you know, a fella named Mike Hyatt and, uh, that has now turned into 13 countries, probably mm -hmm. seven, 8,000 kids sitting in chairs from Afghanistan to, you know, Palestinians wow. in, uh, uh, in areas sitting in classes that they wouldn't be in and think as you're listening to what might happen, if you took whatever you believe in this most, if faith guides your steps, then taking your faith, uh, not to just like identify with it, but to actually do something with it, take a business. And I, we, uh, the, all three of us on this call live at this intersection of faith and commerce and workplace and life and kids and all that, uh, to do something. So uh, from either of you, tell us why this book, mind your mindset, uh, why, why now, why this book? Cause I knew you, I have always known you guys as being very strategic. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it dawned on us, and this was really part of the operating system of our DNA, but we took it for granted, 
is that um, I'd got into a relationship with an executive coach back in the 2000s when I was the CEO, Thomas Nelson. And I was at a place where we had really grown the company, but I was kind of out of tricks. And so I hired this person who is a executive coach who specialized in growth. And so she came in and she said, if you want extraordinary results, and I know you do, you wouldn't have hired me otherwise, then you've got to take extraordinary action. And that's where most people stop. But the truth is, if you want to take extraordinary action, you've got to start thinking in a completely different way because your thinking is what causes the actions which lead to the results. So, Bob, I can remember back in August of 2009, and she flew in. It was in the middle of the recession. And um, we sat down. She came in to Nashville once a month for a full day. It was about 80% psychotherapy and about 20% business coaching. <laughs> And so she was uh, doing her usual tinkering inside of my brain. And she said, well, how did last month turn out? And she meant, what were the financial results of the company? Then I said, not good. She said, well, what happened? And I said, well, I said, we missed the top line by about 10% and we lost money. And she said, well, I'm surprised because when I was here last week or last month, she said, you were so confident that you were going to hit the budget and you thought there was a good chance that you would exceed it. So why did this happen? And I said, well, we're in the middle of a recession and consumer confidence is down and foot traffic at bookstore retail is down. And our publishing industry is like in completely upended because of the digital and the physical and we can't figure it out. And then there's social media. So I gave her a whole litany of excuses, really. And so she said to me, Bob, and this was like one of the most profound questions someone has ever asked me. She said, what was it about your leadership that led to these results? And I was, it was like a punch in the face. I was kind of offended. I said, I just got done explaining to you why this happened. It had nothing to do with my leadership. So she made another pass at it. I still wasn't getting it. And she finally said, well, look, if we were to go back 30 days, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently? And I said, oh yeah. She said, well, like what? I said, well, I would have met with this, the sales team every day just to make sure we were on track. Um, I probably would have gone on that sales call to Walmart so we could have sold more copies in. So she sat back, I gave her like three to five reasons. And she said, well, so what you're telling me is that it was about your leadership. And I went, wow. So I had created this story where I was the victim and I had all these excuses and, and that was my brain. And, and the subtitle of our book is Mind Your Mindset. And the subtitle is The Science That Shows Success Starts With Your Thinking. And what my brain was trying to do was what our brain always tries to do which was to keep me safe. And so it was protecting me from the humility of admitting that this was my problem. But when I did, all of a sudden I got the power back because now I took responsibility and said, oh yeah, it was about my leadership. Now I could lead in a different way. And I did. And the results changed. Megan has her own story, but that was kind of my story for getting into to the thinking and why mindset is so important. Yeah, I want to hear from that, Megan. I just want to offer an idea for those listening to this. We've spoken a lot in this podcast about carving a new groove in your brain. Mm -hmm. and That's it. Going Grand yep. Canyon with it. Like you just the Grand Canyon did, didn't happen overnight. You ran a lot of <clears throat> uh, water through that for a long period of time. And so if it's like what was Mike was saying was to like to just, it's a new way of thinking. It's mm -hmm. ownership of the thing without victimhood. It's not saying I'm not the hero. I'm not the victim. I'm just a participant, mm -hmm. uh, but to participate more. And to, uh, once you understand your rightful place, take your rightful place. Uh, yes. So Megan, tell us a yeah. little bit about your particular uh, yeah. angle on this as you put this together. Well. It really started for me in high school, and uh, I, I ended up with a debilitating fear of public speaking, which I bet you guys listening can relate to. I mean, this is like the number one fear that everybody has, right? Well, I, in high school, had a friend who was giving a presentation in front of a class, and she got overwhelmed with anxiety, ended up running out of the, the presentation room, the auditorium in tears. Oh, and I found oh, her in the no. bathroom. It was terrible. I found her in the bathroom, basically having a panic attack with tears rolling down her face. And unbeknownst to me, I'm very empathetic. 
I developed a story in my head that said, speaking is dangerous. It will lead to certain humiliation. You'll lose control of your body, you know, like danger, danger, avoid, avoid. And so as I I became an adult and went through, you know, the first couple of decades of my life, I avoided anything where I would have to use my voice in public, including it got so absurd that I wouldn't even be comfortable reading a passage of scripture, like in a small group or a book club or something like that. Even that just filled me with dread and anxiety. So fast forward now, you know, I'm into my, my thirties and then uh, beyond, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to advance in my career. And then eventually I joined my dad in our business here. And I had previously just shut down all these opportunities. I didn't want to publish a book because I knew I'd have to speak or do, you know, interviews like this. I didn't want to take promotions where I knew I'd have to make presentations. Well, I had managed to avoid that all along. I became the COO of Full Focus a um, number of years back. And finally, our team was like, you know, funniest thing. We've never had you keynote before. I, I don't know why we've never done that. You know, we need to get you on stage. We're going to do this big event. It's going to be 800 people. Are, would you keynote for us? And I'm thinking to myself, this is my, oh my God. worst nightmare, <laughs> you know, but I know like I can't say no, like I have to say yes, or I basically have to walk away from this career that I love and these people that I love. And so I, I sort of like did the nervous laugh, like, huh, okay, you know, said yes. Meanwhile, only my husband, Joel, knows that I have this fear. My dad doesn't know, none of the team, whatever. And so I immediately called uh, my friend, Michelle Kashat, who is an amazing speech coach. And I said, Michelle, like, I need your help. You know, I need you to help me figure out how to conquer this fear because I'm tired of playing small. I don't want to be small anymore, but I know I've got to do something different. And so that launched me on a six week journey prior to this event of I hired an anxiety coach, a speech coach, a life coach. I had medicine for my doctor. I mean, I was like, <laughs> bring it all, baby. This is awesome. You know? Way to go and- big. <laughs> And I, I mean, I really did. And some of you guys listening, you can relate to this. You've had some something that's holding you back like this. And I had to go to battle. I, I ended up literally on a yellow legal pad, rewriting the story of what it would be like if my old story was speaking is dangerous and it might actually literally kill you. I wrote a whole story of what it would be like to step on stage. And it wasn't like some, you know, like woo-woo affirmation of I'm the best speaker in the whole world. It was just like, I'm able to look the audience in the eye and really connect with them. And what I have to say matters. You know, I have a voice. It matters. And so I would practice this every day with literally a soundtrack from the gladiator. I mean, I I really went big on this. And (laughs) fast forward, I, I, you know, six weeks later, get up on the stage to deliver this keynote. I wasn't nervous. I didn't lose control of my body. I wasn't humiliated. It was actually fun. And I've gone on to do all kinds of stuff after that. Oh my gosh. All because I changed my story. Oh, good on you. I'm I just picturing you like yeah. half of your face painted blue, that brave heart <laughs> moment. <laughs> Did you see yeah, that? it was pretty much like that, except I had like le- uh, leopard print shoes on, you know? Yes, so. <laughs> all a brave heart with leopard print shoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is such a great point for people listening to see if you've had something as you relate to that, both with uh, with Mike and Megan, what they had said, say, what is that fear connected to? Yeah. So you got to find out what's it connected to. Mm-hmm. So uh, we just wrapped up a, uh, a couple day thing up at the Oaks with our friend, uh, Shauna Nequist. Yeah. Was, oh, I love Shauna. Love her. And she just did such a great job. Um, and so if you find out what something is connected to, um, uh, I have like from my youngest years, I remember having this fear that I would be abandoned, whether it was like mm. in a grocery store, or, never happened, but I just mm. had this fear that everybody's going to leave me. So last day of a three day gathering, everybody, what they go home. I get it all choked up because I'm like, mm. everyone's leaving me. This is how it's supposed to work. <laughs> you come, you have some fun, you go. Yet it triggers every single time for a guy that oh, wow. owns a retreat center, the same thing. What's happened is that I've understood what that's connected to. Mm-hmm. And so I can talk to myself. I can just say, yeah. Yeah. everyone's not leaving you. Actually, they are leaving you. They're supposed to be leaving you. <laughs> This is a really good thing that's happening. Yeah. And, and so if uh, anyone listening has ever dropped off the eldest child 
at college, right? Or the youngest child, it's like best worst day ever because something's happening. Do you remember doing that, Michael? Like when you like dropping the kids as everybody's launching, it wasn't with you and Gail, it wasn't an empty nest. It was a bigger nest. Um, Yeah, well, we had five daughters, Megan's the oldest. And um, it was kind of bittersweet because we were kind of looking forward to being empty nesters, which I have to say is pretty awesome. But it was also, you know, a lot quieter. And and there was kind of the wonder that we had about, will they come back? Will they want to hang with us as adults? And, yeah. um, you know, and we went through some rough things with a few of them, not Megan, but with a few of them. But uh, I, I'm pleased to say that all five of our daughters live within 30 minutes of us. And three of the daughters, the three with our 10 grandkids, including Megan, live within five minutes of us. And yeah. so they've become our our best friends. And we just have a great tribe of people and we love being with them. But but there was there were times when I when I wondered, you know, as a parent, if we were going to make it through. Yeah, you just start going through these. So there's some alternate endings. If you can figure out what something is connected to. Uh, this says very much in this like mind your mindset to mm-hmm. see what is that like uh, for some people they this FOMO like fear of missing out uh, for sweet Maria Goff it would be like phobia it'd be fear of being included <laughs> she doesn't want the to opposite go. yeah if you want to do a great job just don't ask her to do that and it's not because she's antisocial she's just really clear on what she's about me the people we made, the people they married, and the people they made. That's the <laughs> beginning, that. middle, and end. Yeah. So, uh, so the uh, knowing what that's connected to, uh, it isn't just a fear of people. It's just it's actually a really calculated focus on some things. And so, talk to people that are listening about how, like, with their businesses, your focus, and many people are balancing business and the relationships that matter the most, whether those are dating relationships or marriage relationships or like, so help us understand just a couple of tools. Give us a little taste of what we would find in the, uh, in the book and all the other offerings you have. I think so much of this book is about developing the skill of self-awareness to recognize that, you know, whatever matters to you, your brain is telling you stories all the time. It's always trying to take the raw facts of your life and give an interpretation of that and give meaning to that so that it has kind of a track to run on. It doesn't like to be in a position where it doesn't know. And so when we become aware of this is how our brain works, we can start to identify what are the stories that we're telling ourselves, you know, maybe about our relationships and our professional lives and what's possible in terms of work-life balance, for example, you know, and are those stories helpful? Are they leading us toward what we really want and what we feel like is our greatest contribution in the world? Or are they standing in the way of that thing? And um, we talk about these three steps in Mind Your Mindset, first of all, to identify your story then to interrogate the story, because sometimes what feels really true, like your example, Bob, of feeling like, you know, you were always going to be abandoned. That's not factually true. I mean, you said that's not been your experience, but it feels so true. You know, for most of us, particularly moments where we have wounding or maybe trauma or something difficult happened, sometimes those stories feel the most true. And yet they're actually the, the least literally true. Like my speaking example, you know, I mean, speaking isn't literally dangerous. It's not literally going to kill anybody. Um, but it sure felt like that. And so we want to try to shake loose the facts from the fiction that our brain is giving us and start to ask the question, is there maybe another interpretation here that would enable me to open up myself to what's possible and what I'm made for in a different way And then you go on to step three after interrogating your story to imagining something bigger, something better, something maybe more in line and more congruent with who you are and and who you want to be and how you want to show up in the world and what you want to contribute. And so those three steps of identify, interrogate and imagine. And of course, we get into all kinds of details in the book of how to go through that. But that's really the crux of it. And I think it's so helpful to have that as a 
a lever in your life that, or a tool in your toolbox? Because most of us, I mean, at least speaking for myself, we're all about taking action. You know, let's, let's go do it. And that's awesome. But sometimes you can't even get to the place where you can take the action because something's holding you back. And oftentimes that's something that's holding you back is a story that you've probably never even become consciously aware of. And that's part of what we're going to teach you how to do in the book. Yeah, that's really well said. I'm thinking about <clears throat> poker players and kind of knowing your tells yeah. and knowing other people's tells. So if your go-to uh, with anxiety is busyness, uh, to say, I'm feeling really anxious. So what I do, so I don't have to deal with the reasons for the anxiety is I just get busy. Know your tells. If like Mike <clears throat> was holding four aces, I don't think you'd have this big cat bird grin on your face because you'd say, like, I don't want to let everybody know. Yet everybody around you knows your tells. The people that know you well enough, they do, you right. cannot hide it. They know what's going on. Um, but uh, for you to understand, your, if you're having a disproportionate reaction yes. to something, you yes. just have a big a cow over whatever it is. It's probably you're overreacting now because you've been underreacting for your entire life. Mm. Uh, that you're reacting to every wrong right now. This is Gettysburg. You're mine. <laughs> tell well, us a little bit more about that, Mike. Well, these these stories that we tell ourselves, um, like Megan said, sometimes they're true, sometimes they're not so true or not so accurate. We know based on the research that 20% of our memories on average are false. And up to 70% of our memories are distorted in some significant aspect. Now, we don't have to go, that doesn't mean we have to correct every story because, you know, stories are, they, they serve a purpose. And some stories are good enough or close enough that they get us through life. But kind of to, the, to your point, Bob, whenever you're feeling stuck, when you're frustrated, when you're angry, when you respond in a way that's kind of out of proportion to the, to the trigger, that's the time to ask yourself what the question is and, or what the narrator is saying. And we, we refer to this person that lives inside of our head as the narrator. This is like a, a football game where there's what happens on the field. You know, the quarterback passed to this guy and it was intercepted. And, you know, those are all the facts. But then there are the commentators who can't stop blabbing. They're talking about what it means, where are the games going, what it's going to mean for their season. All this interpretation that's layered on top of the facts. And I think one of the, the basic insights of the book is that there is a difference between what happens to you and the meaning that you assign to what happens to you and the narrator's there to provide the meaning. And sometimes the narrator can be enormously helpful, but sometimes they're just repeating things, again, that keep you safe, keep you small, keep you in your comfort zone, and all the good stuff's going to happen in your discomfort zone. So you got to be able to disable that narrator or reprogram the narrator so that they're giving you a more empowering story. Yeah, I understand too, if you're listening to this and you've been wounded before, just, mm -hmm. it happens to all of us, um, but just how do you deal with that? And there might be kind of a gradation of that. If it's just like kind of a flag on the play, it's like, hey, no big deal. Like <laughs> it's just like a nickel problem. If you have felt betrayed, that would be a larger order of magnitude. Um, mm -hmm. My uh, would all do if it's a big deal, I'll totally turtle. I'll just get yeah. just like arms, legs, tail, head. I'm like, uh, no one's here. <laughs> and, uh, the, and that's just like, uh, that would be an instinct. Some people uh, ignore that something really hurtful happened and they uh, move forward. They just put a happy face on. Uh, I'm just guessing that's going to leak out somewhere else in another behavior. If you have felt out of control, oftentimes you'll find people who are trying to control you very much. And my best guess is they probably have some other things that are feel wildly beyond their control. And you happen to be in the web and they are going to over control you. Can you tell me about that making with the probably in yeah. parenting, like that would be a great example of, uh, where either you felt that or you've seen the kids. Uh, yeah. I, I found that people want to be influenced. They don't want to be controlled. So totally. I, well, yeah. you know, part of our parenting journey has been walking with our children 
as they've healed from trauma, you know, no child that's available for adoption. We have two children who went through their parents' divorce or my stepchildren. And then we have three children who came to our family through adoption. And in both cases, they've all, or, you know, both sets of kids, they've all been through tremendous amount of trauma. And it's been so interesting because we have worked, we actually dedicate the book to our Lita James, who is um, one of one of two people that we dedicated to, who's an attachment therapist that we've worked with, with our middle boys who, like I said earlier, adopted from Uganda. And so much of her work is narrative based therapy. And really what she's doing is she is helping them to rewrite their story because what happens for children who have gone through the kind of trauma that again, all children who are available for adoption at one degree or another have gone uh, through is that they, they think that something must have been wrong with them in order to be made available for adoption. You know, like they, they don't, but this is just how kids are. They're, they're a little bit narcissistic, you know, and they think everything must be around them. It's happens for kids who are go through divorce as well. And part of what she's doing is she's helping to say, let's get the right feelings on the right events and the right people and off of, in their case themselves, because of course they, they had no power in that situation. It's always about the parents and what was going on in their environment and often many tragedies that had nothing to do with the kids. And I think that that's an extreme example because not all of us have been through that level of trauma, but I think it applies to everybody in that sometimes, like you were talking about with orders of magnitude, Bob, sometimes we need somebody else outside of ourselves that can be a therapist, a friend, a mentor, a coach, uh, a pastor who can come alongside us and help us untangle our stories so that ultimately we can be free from those unconscious drives, like you were just talking about to over control, because maybe back in our history, we felt really out of control, or maybe in the present, we felt really out of control. And so we talk about this and mind your mindset that we can use the wisdom of other people to help us think things that we just maybe don't have access to in the present. And that's the gift that we can be to each other, whether that's a, a professional type of relationship or just a, an informal relationship with a great friend. Um, I think our influence on each other's lives and certainly as parents is powerful in terms of the stories that we tell and getting out of the ones that are unhelpful. Yeah. I feel like I just took everybody that listens to this podcast to a really great restaurant and they say, what's good on the menu? And I said, everything. <laughs> <laughs> what's at the top of the menu right now uh, is this book, Mind Your Mindset. But I want you to uh, dig in, uh, check out Megan and Mike and what they're doing. Uh, and uh, find there's just so much uh, depth in terms of resources. And I'm not saying that Thank these you. are loud voices in my life. And so from coaching to mentoring to uh, resources to run your business and all that. Um, and then just people that are just modeling their faith. They're just living their faith in authentic, real ways. And so I just want to thank you guys for being in that, uh, those two big places that are fixed points in my life. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for writing the book. It's not an easy uh, endeavor, but you're going to touch a lot of lives. Thanks, thanks Bob. Thank right you. back at you. you. You've been a big influence for us too. Well, Absolutely. you've been listening to the Dream Big podcast. Pick up this book, Mind Your Mindset, uh, and then uh, jump into all the other res resources there. Uh, you're going to really enjoy those. Um, you guys, uh, what I want you to do, the next five minutes is the best five minutes. I want you to write down what you heard uh, Mike or Megan talk about and then decide what you're going to do about it. Because, right, like you can have a hope without a plan is a wish. And you want to just say agree because you won't find that anywhere in the scriptures. You'll find a lot about do something with it. All right, you guys, we'll talk to you next week.